Major League Baseball Productions presents Angels Memories, the greatest moments in Angels baseball history. Before the Angels' 2011 home opener, the ceremonial first pitch was delivered by Eli Gerba, the same man who, half a century earlier, threw the first pitch in franchise history. That throwback, caught by owner Artie Marino, launched the 50th anniversary celebration of the Angels franchise. I didn't get it there. I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't do it. <laughs> Perhaps the biggest story of the Major League meetings is the awarding of the Los Angeles franchise in the American League to a group headed by Gene Autry and Bob Reynolds. When the American League decided to expand in 1960, the announcement caught the attention of Gene Autry, the famous singing cowboy, from radio, TV, and the silver screen. Autry and his business partner, Bob Reynolds, owned a broadcasting company in Southern California. In December, they traveled to St. Louis for the league meetings, hoping to get in on the action. Their desire was to simply get the broadcasting rights, but as the meetings went along, uh, Joe Cronin was the president of the American League, and he said, Gene, why would you not be the owner of the Angels? Autry, who had been a lifelong baseball fan, immediately answered that it would be a great honor. Well, I must say that it's a happy moment for me to uh, bring an American League franchise back to our hometown of Los Angeles. With only a few months to prepare for opening day, Autry and Reynolds hired Fred Haney as the club's first general manager, and Bill Rigney, who was let go the previous year by the San Francisco Giants, as their first skipper. Fred had good contacts in baseball, and so did Bill Rigney. So they were calling some of their friends in the game to get some scouting reports on players. During the first expansion draft in baseball history, the Angels selected the organization's first 30 players. They came out of the expansion draft with far better players than the Washington Club, which had been created at the same time. We did all kinds of publicity shots, including the bicycle run that was so famous all over the United States, where we rode our bikes to spring training. The Angels' first spring training home was located in Palm Springs, and the players had few, if any, objections. How many times do you get to Palm Springs? My God, that was like going to heaven. We didn't beat anybody for the first eight or 10 days when we'd come to Palm Springs because we were out, you know. I'm not saying we broke curfew, we just didn't know when it was. On April 11th, the Los Angeles Angels faced Baltimore in their first regular season game. And despite the weather, the West Coast's newest club proved up to the task. Big uh, Ted Klazowski. <laughs> Cold days down there with his short sleeve shirt and let's go get him, he said. And Kluzewski helped the Halos do just that, hitting two home runs en route to a 72 route over the Orioles. It was victory number one for the Angels franchise. All of us writers probably went overboard in our story saying how, hey, this red tag group of players is gonna be more formidable than anyone ever anticipated. The Angels finished their inaugural season with a record of 70 and 91, the best ever for an expansion team. To come close to 500 baseball was beyond what we should have expected. I think it surprised all of us. After calling LA's Wrigley Field home during the 1961 season, the Angels looked for help from their National League neighbors the following year. Walter O'Malley opened Dodger Stadium in 62 and allowed the Angels to play there, but it wasn't a good situation. They were constantly in the Dodgers' shadow. The Dodgers were a storied franchise and the media darlings of Southern California, while the Angels were still the new kids in town. Worse still, they would now play their home games in Dodger Stadium. 
But just when they needed it most, a young Southpaw put the halos in the headlines. On May 5, 1962, Bo Belinsky, in just his fourth big league start, threw a no-hitter at Chavez Ravine. He threw the first no-hitter before Koufax, uh, anybody in, in California history. The 25-year-old became an overnight sensation, winning his first five starts while being vaulted into the Hollywood spotlight, bringing his ball club some much-needed publicity. The headlines that Gene Autry wanted so bad, all of a sudden, the Angels are on front-page news. Belinsky was a hot topic, and the Angels were heating up along with him. Led by Lee Thomas and the slugging Leon Wagner, the Angels remarkably sat atop the American League standings on July 4th. And upon their return from a long road trip, the team received a warm welcome home. We had fans sitting at the airport waiting for us to come in. Moments that you'll never forget. They remained in the pennant race well into September and surprised many by finishing third in the 10-team American League. In 1964, another Angels pitcher took center stage. Right-hander Dean Chance was so dominant that many of the league's best hitters were rendered helpless. He had such a devastating delivery. He had a good moving fastball. In fact, Mantle got up one time at the plate and he looked at me and says, this is a waste of time. With 20 wins and a league low 1.65 ERA, Dean Chance beat out Dodger star Sandy Koufax for the lone Cy Young Award in Major League Baseball. That same year, the Angels broke ground in Anaheim to build a ballpark of their own. After changing their name to the California Angels in 65, the franchise moved into Anaheim Stadium the next season and more than doubled the previous year's attendance, drawing 1.4 million fans to the Big A. The stadium was so beautiful and we had our own club and our own place and had a chance to create our own image. And Jim Fergosi was a key figure in that image. The shortstop was a six-time All-Star with the Angels and partnered with second baseman Bobby Knopp to form a gold glove winning double play combination. If they had the television coverage of today, uh, they would have been on TV night in and night out. This may be trouble. Cut up with a beautiful catch. In 1970, left-hander Clyde Wright won 22 games for the Angels, including Anaheim Stadium's first no-hitter. The pitch, curve line to Fergusi, one half. He goes to second for one. On the first, on the hitter for Clyde Wright. I was happy, jumping up and down. People asked me questions. And I still don't remember the answers I gave him. I have no idea. Outfielder Alex Johnson edged out Carl Yastrzemski to win the 1970 American League batting title, becoming the first and only Angel to do so. In 1971, the Angels traded away the face of the franchise, Jim Fergosi, for four players, including a young fireballer. I was kind of heartbroken, to be very honest with you. I just felt like I was always going to play my whole career for the Angels, and it really kind of surprised me. For Ghost, he was a poster boy for the Angels all the way through these years, and all of a sudden he's traded for a guy, Nolan Ryan, that nobody heard about. Heading into the 1972 season, the Angels were eager to see if and when their new young right-hander would live up to his potential. Nolan threw 100 miles an hour. We knew that he was a little bit wild, but we knew that someday when he, when everything clicked, that he was gonna be great. Ryan rose to the occasion in his first season with the Angels, winning 19 games and leading the majors in strikeouts with 329. The trade, as it turned out, had created a new star in California. He established a bit of competitive spirit, a spot of dominance that the Angels had never had. Watch out. That type of an attitude was a, a big thing for the Angels organization to up to that point didn't really have that meanness or toughness. The Ryan Express steamed through American League lineups, 
and in 1973, he notched his first no-hitter. That night, when I warmed up, I didn't have very good command or very good stuff. As I went along, inning after inning, I got into a groove, and, and my stuff got better. Ryan, who led the majors in strikeouts with 329 last year, had his first major league no-hitter. A second no-no followed exactly two months later, and Ryan capped off the season by setting a new standard for strikeouts with number 383, coming in his final appearance of the year. Ryan would go on to pitch two more no-hitters in an Angel uniform. And when paired with left-hander Frank Tanana, the Halos had a dominant one-two punch. Ryan and Tanana were as good as any tandem we've ever had. I thought they were as talented as Koufax and Drysdale. Tanana, he struck him out. You had Nolan coming hard to the right. Now you had Tanana coming hard from the left. Frank was about as dominating a left-hander during that period of time as there was. Curveball got him swinging. There's number six for Tanana. With the Angels' arms in order, Gene Autry used free agency to add muscle to the lineup. California's Angels signed free agents Baylor, Joe Rudy, and this man, Bobby Gritch. The offense that had been missing throughout most of the 70s, suddenly they were able to put something together. And in 78, the Halos brought back a familiar face to take charge. New manager Jim Fregosi, a tough test for a rookie skipper. Well, I don't know if this is a test for me, it's a test for the whole ball club. What he brought when he came in was a lot of energy and a lot of passion. They also added a career 318 hitter and free agent Lyman Bostock to an improving offense. Well, Lyman Bostock got off to a horrendous start. Lyman offered his paycheck to Mr. Autry. He says, uh, you brought me over here to hit for you, and I'm not, and uh, here's your money back. And uh, Mr. Autry uh, refused to take the check. And he took his check and he donated it to his church. I don't know if that's what took the curse off of him or what happened, but as soon as he did that, he caught on fire. All of a sudden, for the first time, the Angels had a legitimate contender. The Angels stayed in the race until late September, and then, after a game in Chicago, they were hit with tragic news. I was awakened at about 3 in the morning by a knock on the door. It was Brian Downing, and he said, uh, Lyman just got shot, and he's dead. And he said, you got to be kidding me. We were all in heavy shock, you know, to lose him. Fergosi's team, bolstered by the addition of seven-time batting champ Rod Carew, looked to regroup in 79. Jim, how does it feel to have Rod on your team? Well, one thing, I think it gives us a legitimate hitter in the middle of our lineup. And no one benefited more from Carew's presence than Don Baylor. 1979 just started out as one of those years. Once I got to April, I said, I'm off and running now. With 36 home runs and a league leading 139 RBI, Baylor was named the American League's MVP. And when we needed a big hit or someone to hit the ball out of the ballpark, Baylor was there. Offensively, uh, we could uh, score with just about anybody. We had a penchant for coming from behind and winning ball games. The fans started yelling, yes, we can. Yes, yes we, we can. can. Next thing you know, the whole house is going, yes, we can. Next day, there's signs, yes, we can. They became the yes, we can angels. We started filling the ballparks. People started believing. And the angels kept winning. The Cowboys' dream postseason baseball appeared to finally be within reach. Tanana was on the mound. That was a ground ball hit to Carew. Porter sends it to Carew. This ship do it. He knocks it down. He goes to Tanana. It's over. It's over. We finally won a division. For the first time in 19 years. And tonight, it is yes, they will. And yes, they did. Seeing how excited the Angels fans were, I'll never forget that. There's got to be some tears of joy and happiness. We were all excited because our goal as a team was to win that for Gene. We was happy for our owner because we knew what type of owner that we was, was playing for. To see the look on Gene Autry's face was really quite a thrill for me. But the Angels lost the ALCS to Baltimore, and during the offseason, they also lost the face of the franchise. GM Buzzy Bavese decided not to re-sign ace Nolan Ryan, who had won 138 games in eight seasons as an Angel. I don't believe he was appreciated enough by our general manager. You know, he made a couple comments with Nolan, he get two eight-game winners or whatever, he could replace Nolan Ryan. That was devastating to our team. That was absolutely one of the lowest points. I can't imagine how good we would have been if he had been pitching for us in 1982. 
Instead, the club took a step backwards, but help was on the horizon as the Angels would once again return to the postseason. Prior to the 82 season, the Angels signed 11-time All-Star Reggie Jackson, who announced his presence as only Reggie could. You were quiet the last four or five days. Now all of a sudden you got a hit yesterday. You, you wanted the boys. You're up front. You can all that back the last couple of days. I felt responsible for my contract to the fans and to the Autries, and I felt like if I could do my job that we'd have a real good chance of winning. Jackson hits one high and deep to right field. You can tell it good. Reggie was joined by several other new acquisitions, including Bob Boone, Tim Foley, and Doug DeSensei, to round out a lineup that already featured Bobby Gritch, Brian Downing, it's got a home run for Downing, and former MVPs Rod Carew, Fred Lynn, and Don Baylor. We got the nucleus of a real special team. Well, you might have the best offensive ball club the Angels ever had. Probably the most intense group of players I've ever been around. Everybody really comes to win and play as hard as they possibly can. And he it was a good team to be on. It was easy to play. It was one of the more enjoyable seasons that I ever had. Two games behind Kansas City on September 17th, the Angels got hot, winning 10 of their next 14 to take the Western Division crown. Ground ball back to Sanchez, and the Angels have won the West. In the ALCS, the Halos hosted the first two games of a best of five series against Milwaukee. We wanted to play uh, Milwaukee, and we got them. We handled it pretty easily at our place in Anaheim. They win the first two games here in Anaheim, and they go back to Milwaukee needing one win. With the franchise's first World Series appearance in sight, no one was happier than manager Gene Mock, who had presided over an epic collapse as a Philly skipper in 1964. Now he was poised for redemption. And I'm saying, I've got to do this with Gene Mock because I knew about what happened with the Phillies, and I personally wanted it bad for him. That's all that went through my mind in Milwaukee. But at County Stadium, the home team evened the series. And the Brewers have come back to take two in a row. For the decisive Game 5, the Angels sent Game 2 winner Bruce Keeson back to the mound. We knew Bruce couldn't go very long. He had a terrible blister on his finger. In fact, it was, I don't know how he pitched. There had to have been blood on the ball uh, because he had no skin at all on his middle finger. God, a home run for Ben Ogilvy. It got down to key hits. They got the big ones, and uh, we didn't get it. Down by one in the ninth, with two outs in the tying running scoring position, the Angels had one last chance to win the 82 AL pennant. The Angels have the tying run at second. Gene Mock, he couldn't have a better man up than Rodney Crew. When I went up to hit, we were running at second base. I wanted to come through in the worst way. Not for me, not for the team, but for Gene. I was devastated because I've been able to get all these base hits all the time and then, you know, when I needed to get a hit for him, I wasn't able to do it. John McNamara took over as manager in 1983, but after two disappointing seasons, the Angels brought Gene Mock back to the bench. I'm as excited and enthusiastic as I've ever been in my life. And I can't uh, hardly wait to get going again. But while the little general had returned, 1985 would be the final season for one of the greatest hitters the game has ever known. The injuries kind of slowed me down. I didn't want to go out there and embarrass myself. Plus, I knew we had a young kid coming up that was ready to, to play. A young kid who has a flair for the dramatic in his rookie season. Stepping onto the stage in 86 was Wally Joyner, who made an instant impact. After 40 games in the big leagues, I had 17 home runs. Long 
drive to right field. No doubt about that one. He was just what we needed. We had a cast of veteran players, but he was a big shot in the arm for that 86 team. By early July, the Halos were flying high and leading the division. Grand slam home run and the Angels win it. The bullpen was anchored by closer Donnie Moore, an all-star in 85. Donnie was central to the Angels' success in 86. Donnie Moore was a dominating pitcher. He did an incredible job for us. We had a good solid season that year. We were very consistent throughout the whole year, didn't have any big peaks and valleys. And Mock did a tremendous job of managing that season. And the celebration is on. The Angels have won the American League Western Division title. In the ALCS, the Angels faced the Boston Red Sox, and once again, Gene Mock was starved for postseason glory. Gene Mock in his 25th season of managing, looking for his first world championship. I'd like this team to win this championship uh, more than I'd like to eat when I'm hungry. Aided by Wally Joyner's clutch hitting, the Angels took a two games to one lead, but an injury in game three forced the rookie to miss the remainder of the series. There was a play at home plate where I eluded a tag from Rich Gedman. During that play, I didn't know that I had contracted staph infection in my shin. Despite Joyner's absence, the Angels took game four with a thrilling, come from behind extra inning win. And the Angels go up three games to one. What a great series. Down by a run in game five, with one on and two out in the sixth, Bobby Gritch stepped in to face Bruce Hurst. He really liked throwing a 2 2 curveball. I remember that a number of times, and that was his out pitch. One ball, two strikes the count. And he threw me a curveball, kind of reached out, and almost one handed it. To center field. Dave Henderson went back and deep. in front of the top of the fence and carrying. hit the heel of his glove. Just off his glove for a home run. That put us ahead three to two. Anaheim Stadium is rocking. And you see the expression on Bobby's face when he rounds third. And you think, well, this is the time, right? Amazing. We're finally going to get to the promised land. And when he raised his hands above his head, everybody in that place was on their feet because he was saying, yes, we're going to get that World Series finally. The Angels lead 5-2 to two as we go to the top of the ninth inning. With three outs to go, Angels starter Mike Witt returned to the mound. And even though the leadoff batter reached base, the ace kept his composure. This was a watershed moment in the history of the California Angels. Looked like they had it won. They had a, a big lead in the ninth inning, and I really don't know what happened. To left field and deep, and she's gone. And now it's five to four, and Dwight Evans pops up. One out to go. So we got two outs, nobody on. So we're still looking good. The next batter was Rich Gedman, who was three for three on the day against Witt. So Mock decided it was time to go to his bullpen. This is exactly the way Gene Mock would play it under any circumstance. The new pitcher, Gary Lucas, who had enjoyed recent success against Gedman in game four the previous night. And Gene Mock, who has to manage logically and not with his emotions, brought Lucas into the game last night to face one batter, Gedman. He struck him out. Gary Lucas had tremendous control. He wasn't nervous. He was a veteran player. It was a fluke, fluke, fluke thing. You start to think that the baseball gods are against you when stuff like that happens. Still needing just one out, the Angels called on closer Donnie Moore to face Dave Henderson and try to secure the franchise's first pennant. The chance to actually win, to go to the World Series for the first time, everything about it was just surreal. One and two. Two strikes. Two outs. and they had the lead. Unbelievable! I said, what is going on here? Astonishing! And it felt like somebody just let all the air out of the stadium. You could hear a pin drop, literally. It was a moment I'll never forget. You're looking at one for the ages. Our bubble had burst, and our hearts fell to the ground. The Red Sox lead 6-5. to five. The Angels tied the game in the home half of the ninth but the Red Sox ended it in the 11th. The momentum had shifted. Right now we're down, but uh, 
Okay. We're not out. So just got to go to Boston and take care of them there. I sat with Bob Boone on the plane as we flew back to Boston. And I remember Bob saying to me, I'm scared. And I said, why? He said, sometimes when the air goes out of the balloon, you can't pump it back up. Pitches a curve into deep left field and 7-0 Boston. It was a tremendous failure on our part. We got totally outplayed in those two games, and they had such momentum going. In games six and seven, Boston outscored the Angels 18 to five and put the finishing touches on one of the greatest comebacks in MLB postseason history. You have to feel a little bit for that man. You really do. Gene Mock never will forget the look on that man's face, looking so sad in the dugout because it slipped away again. As for Donnie Moore, he was never able to escape the dark shadow cast by the game five loss. The following year, every time Donnie would come on the field, he'd get booed. It was heartbreaking for me to see, and I know the players had to feel the same thing around him, and I know what Donnie must have felt, too. This game can really lead to some bad things. Bobby Gritch retired after the 86 season, and Gene Mock stepped down before the opener in 88. For the Angels, another period of transition and uncertainty was now underway. That era that got us to that level started to dissipate. It wasn't a heck of a lot to cheer about if you're an Angel fan. Throughout their history, the Angels and their fans have suffered more than their share of heart-wrenching losses. could have come back and won. You don't blame a loss on one guy. You just don't do that. And they'll shower him. And maybe they're going more, but you know they're not. Anytime there was a move for Donnie, I can remember you know, him coming out to a chorus of boos. And that's uh, hard to handle. Less than three years after that fateful pitch, Donnie was gone. We got a call from the general manager telling us that he had taken his own life. Somebody said he blamed the loss on himself. It was a real shock. On July 18th, 1989, Moore shot his wife three times and then turned the gun on himself. Tanya Moore survived, but Donnie was dead at the age of 35. It affected us all on the team and it affected baseball. That was a sad day and that sport that you love could have such a tragic ending. Sadly, it was not the first time an Angels player had died under violent circumstances. Lyman Bostock, star outfielder for the California Angels, one of the highest paid players in baseball, shot to death late last night in Gary, Indiana. I was just like in shock when I, when I was told that he was shot. Even though he had spent less than one full season in an Angels uniform, Bostock had become a fan favorite and a respected teammate. We have been deprived of a great player, a great friend. And an unmatched spirit has left the Angel Clubhouse. It was a very difficult time for the ball club band, for everybody that was involved with the Angel organization to lose a guy like Lyman. The tragic losses of Moore and Bostock were felt throughout the organization. And in May of 1992, a traffic accident nearly took the lives of other members of the Angels family. Our bus driver all of a sudden started screaming, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And I, we looked up and the bus one in front of us was gone. It was nowhere to be seen. Chuck Finley and I ran over and this bus was leaning up against a couple of really small trees on its side 
chaotic. Guys were screaming inside. It was just bedlam. We just didn't know what had happened, you know. And next thing we know, we're on the side, and guys are falling all over the place. There's people everywhere. Rod Carew was underneath a seat, I think, broke his ribs. And our manager, Buck Rogers, got thrown through the windshield of the front of the bus laying out in the, in the woods. Here you are at the middle of the night on this turnpike in the pitch black, just dazed and confused. I mean, really, the, the, even the guys who weren't on the, in the, you know, just coming off, we're a major league team, this happened, what's going on? It seemed impossible that one team could be forced to endure so much tragedy. For some, the only way to explain it was to blame the so-called curse of the cowboy as the reason for the Angels' four-decade World Series drought. After their World Series victory in 2002, the Angels thought that the dark days were finally behind them. The curse was officially lifted in October of 2002. Or was it? On April 8, 2009, 22-year-old right-hander Nick Aidenhart made his first start of the season and just the fourth of his big league career. Over six scoreless innings, he shut down the Oakland offense. Breaking ball, that one freezes him, struck him out looking. From a youngster that worked very, very hard to make it to the major leagues, had Tommy John surgery before he even threw a pitch in professional baseball, to where he was on that night was an incredible, incredible rise. And he is pitching by far his best game in his major league career. For me, it was one of those great moments when it was like, okay, he's here now, he's, he's on his way. This is Nick Aidenhart, and this is what he's gonna be for the next. 15 years, he's gonna be a great pitcher. The next morning, my phone rings, and the person at the other end says, uh, we need you to get out to Anaheim and cover the Aiden Hart story. And I said, well, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, well, uh, well, Nick, Nick Aiden Hart was killed last night. About 7 o'clock a.m., I get a phone call and said he had passed, and, and I couldn't believe it. It was tough for us, man. When you lose a teammate, it's like losing one of your brothers. Getting through it was uh, probably the toughest thing that any of us have gone through. Walking in that clubhouse, you know, a month after Nick died, it was still affecting everybody. Two months after he died, it affected everybody. You know, it was a sad, sad thing to have it end all that soon. It was just such a devastating blow to me personally that, that even now, there are days when I, I really have a hard time with it. The one thing we take forward with us about Nick is the feeling he had and how he looked out there coming out of that game. And for one moment, he felt like he was on top of the world. And to see that gives you a small sense of peace that this guy was out there and able to do what he loved to do, even though obviously he was not long enough on this earth. There were so many bad things that happened in this organization. It was really a shame. But it shows perseverance wins out, and there's always success at the end of the road. Since the franchise's first season in 1961, many players made major contributions in an Angels uniform. But three homegrown rookies wasted no time when it came to making an impact in Anaheim. Before his big league debut, Jim Abbott was perhaps the most anticipated Angels prospect ever. And it wasn't just because he was the club's first round draft pick in 1988. I was born differently. I was born missing my right hand. And you can't deny that that's a huge part of who you are. Abbott's remarkable journey to the majors culminated on April 8, 1989, when he made his debut against the Seattle Mariners. When his first start came, I mean, it was packed house. Pitching for your Angels, number 25. I just remember being a little bit overwhelmed that day. I was excited, I was confident, but it was so big. You know, the stadium and the lights and the crowd and the excitement of it. Although he departed in the fifth inning and took the loss, Abbott had begun a career that many imagined impossible. The first time you go out there, I tell you, it was a nice feeling. You know, certainly the crowd support was, was a big deal for me. The more you watched Abbott pitch, the more you were astounded by it how he did it. I just had to figure out a way to throw and catch with my left hand. I think it drove me. Abbott finished the 89th season with 12 victories and four complete games, 
good for a fifth place finish in the voting for American League Rookie of the Year. Just three years earlier, another Angel rookie made his debut and turned out to be a team savior. Although Wally didn't look the part of a slugging first baseman. Not really a strong, strong guy. But the ball jumped off his bat. High drive, deep right field, and see you later. Gone. Tremendous home run by Wally Joyner. Slightly balding, kind of baby-faced, little red-cheeked guy with kind of a soft, round body, and you kind of go, wait a minute, you sure you don't work at a bakery or something? Joyner tore up the American League right off the bat, slugging 16 home runs by May 26th and helping to create a new fan frenzy. We went on this long road trip and we came back on a Friday night. The crowd was buzzing and all of a sudden this huge banner was unveiled and it said, Welcome to Wally World. Wally World! There's the sign on the upper deck. Anaheim was right around the corner to Disneyland and that's where Wally World was supposed to be. It was a, a, a great time for me. You couldn't write stories uh, about the way he ended games. We're down three to two, man on second base. Wally's up. Oh, yeah, we're going to win. We got to win. Sure enough, boom, home run. The pitch to Joyner. Hit high in the air to right field. Way back it is gone. And the upper deck of the Angels are on top. Wally World soon went national as Joyner reached 20 home runs by the All Star break and became the first Angels rookie elected to start in the Midsummer Classic. Not that I didn't enjoy being there, but I, I felt out of place. The all-star team on the American League was just Hall of Famer after Hall of Famer after Hall of Famer. I walked into that clubhouse and I just looked around and I saw all of these names. It was incredible. Battling injuries, Joyner struggled in the second half, but he still managed to drive in 100 runs and help lead the Angels to the postseason. With a lot of breaks, a lot of great games come from behind. We played good enough to win this league. Joyner hit 455 in the playoff loss to Boston, which capped off one of the greatest rookie campaigns in Halo history. Pitcher Bobolinski's career in an Angels uniform may have been brief, but his impact on the organization was huge. Bolinski's been pitching good ball for the Angels this year. He made his debut in 62 during the Angels' second season. The guy that put the Angels on the map was May the 5th, 1962, at Dodger Stadium against the Baltimore Orioles. Bo Belinsky threw a no-hitter. Can he do it? And the 1-1 pitch. It's hung on it, popped up in the shallow left field. It's a no-hitter for Belinsky's no-hitter captivated everyone in the ballpark, including a Hollywood power broker, who saw a potential crossover star on the mound. Walter Winchell's up in the stands watching all this, this no-hitter unfold, and this magical night, and this guy named Bo Belinsky, perfect Hollywood name. He's not looking at Bo like a, like a baseball player, he's looking at him as a Hollywood star. Walter Winchell starts setting him up with these starlets, and it's an A-list. All of a sudden, Bo Belinsky's not just a baseball player. The public relations department loved him, some of the ball players were envious, and uh, some people were just playing mad at him. That's because Bo seemed to be focusing more on his extracurricular activities than on his pitching. Belinsky's off-the-field lifestyle quickly caught up with him, and he was traded after the 1964 season. Although he appeared in less than 70 games as an Angel, Bo's rise and fall will never be forgotten. Both Angels rookies and veterans benefited from the wisdom of coaching legend Jimmy Reese a baseball lifer who had a rather famous roommate during his playing days. Once spent a lot of time gazing at the bed supposedly <laughs> occupied by Babe Ruth <laughs> while Ruth was sampling the cultural offerings of whatever city the Yankees were visiting. Reese joined the organization in 1972 and served as the Halos conditioning coach. His specialty was hitting fungos in practice using a sawed off bat he had made himself. The flat end is, and I picked the ball up, uh, when they hit, throw the ball back to me, instead of bending over, I used the bat, adds a couple of years to my career. He could exercise you, running you back and forth across the field with a fungo. He could play catch with you with a fungo. They say he could throw batting practice with a fungo. For 23 years, Jimmy's influence went beyond the diamond and throughout the organization. In fact, former Angel great Nolan Ryan even named one of his sons after Reese. The effect he had on players was really remarkable, the, the calming effect. I know 
he and Jim Abbott particularly were very close. There's Jim Abbott chatting with Jimmy Reese. Boy, there is a wide spread in baseball yeah, experience. Really is, <laughs> I get goosebumps thinking about him. You know, he really took me under his wing, and, and I would sit and spend time with him, and what a wonderful presence to have around a ball team. After Reese's death in 1994, the Angels retired jersey number 50 in his honor. During the first half century of Angels baseball, Halo fans have been provided with many reasons to cheer. And every once in a while, an Angel was able to transform an ordinary, regular season game into a historic event. Late in 2008, Francisco Rodriguez thrilled the home crowd when he set the single season saves record. And the 3 2 delivery on the way to Raul. Swag and a miss. And he's done it as he looks to the sky, goes to his knees out there with his 58th save, an all time major league record. The durability was unbelievable. When you go out there and you get that many saves, you know, you're leaving it all out there day in and day out, not only physically but mentally. It's just an incredible feat. That is save number 62. Again, a new Major League Baseball record. While K-Rod was the first to record more than 60 saves in a season, another Halo hurler was just the 19th to reach 300 wins in her career. And the big story of this game is Don Sutton's quest for personal victory number 300. At age 41, Sutton dominated the Texas Rangers, surrendering only one run and three hits over nine innings. He's one strike away from 300 victories. If you were watching the game, you probably didn't realize. We got two strikes on Gary Ward. Bob Boone was the catcher. One and two, the count to Gary Ward. Two outs in the ninth. I look in for a sign from Bob Boone. Well, he's looking down, contemplating his toenails. And 300th win, ninth inning, two outs, two strikes. You know, I start rocking. Finally, he sticks down slider. He went around, and it's over. And I didn't think about it with all the stuff that's going on in the game, but a number of years later, I happened to see Boone, and I said, will you tell me what the heck you were doing with two strikes of Gary Ward? He said, I was trying to figure out what pitch I could call that he would swing and miss because I wanted to hold the last out. Two seasons earlier, Mike Witt joined an even more exclusive club, making Halo history on the road in Texas. Programs! Simply by being perfect. My wife happened to be there. She was the only wife on the road trip that day. And it was a culmination of my first really good year. In the final game of the 1984 season, Witt was in complete control. Strike three, fastball of the knee. After the seventh inning is when I thought, okay, let's, let's do this. This is important to everybody. Two down, last of the ninth inning. Two balls a strike. Bouncing ball to second, he's got to do it. Six years later, Witt had a chance to close out another no-hitter, one started by new teammate Mark Langston. For Witt, it was deja vu, but for Langston, it was a memorable Angels debut. Anytime you get an opportunity to put a, a uniform on with a brand new team, it doesn't matter who it's with, it's always you're more nervous than you could possibly be. One, two, pitch, swung on a miss strike three. I was only supposed to go five, I think, and ended up getting to the seventh, and I was Done. I was out of gas. Mike Witt has come out of the pen and will take over for Mark Langston. You can't do much better than no hits and no runs. Witt threw two innings without allowing a base runner and returned to the record books. The 2 2 pitch. Got him swinging with a curveball. Mark Langston and Mike Witt combined for a no hitter. One month later, Witt was shipped to New York for slugger Dave Winfield, who had been considered washed up by the Yankees. Here they're saying for years, from 1986 on, he's done, he can't play. He won't, he'll never come back. He's comeback player of the year. So that was the next step in my career. The following season, at age 39, he hit for the cycle. And belted his 400th career home run. Uh oh, that's hit well. 
And back looking up. And gone number 400. But Angel fans had already witnessed an even more heralded home run. When Reggie Jackson became the 13th player to hit number 500. Set to lead it off for the Angels here in the home half at number seven is Reggie. Reggie was a tremendous player. Uh, you know, a, a great for our game. You know, a guy that, you know, had a tremendous amount of flair and uh, lived up to it. To be, you know, side by side in a moment. So I thought that was pretty cool. As Reggie was rounding the bases, he rounded third base and sort of glanced out at the mound and didn't, you know, doff his cap, but, you know, we had eye contact like, you know, this is a moment. And he was, you know, very respectful of, I think, you know, this place in history. With Reggie's magical milestone behind him, the Angels turned their focus towards Rod Carew's pursuit of another notable number, 3,000 hits, and Reggie made sure Carew got there. I was thinking of walking away from the game. You know, I was starting to hurt a lot, and I was close, and I told Reggie, I says, you know, I think I'm going to hang it up. He says, oh, you're not going to hang it up. He says, I'm going to kick your rear if you think about hanging it up. He says, Rod, he says, this is your ticket to the Hall of Fame. So Reggie was the one that really, you know, pushed me to keep playing and, and, and go after it. I think deep down inside he was nervous, more of anticipating the moment, but he, he definitely talked about it and would tease about it, you know, when he went a day or two without getting a hit or so and looked forward to the moment. The moment finally arrived against his former team, the Minnesota Twins. There's a drive to left field, base hit. There's number 3,000 for Carew. So Carew has joined the illustrious 3,000 hit club. It was better than what I thought because of the team that I was playing against. And not to embarrass them or show them up, but to let the fans in the Twin Cities see it. You couldn't ask for a better time to do it. 3,000 for Rod Carew, and his teammates are coming out on the field to congratulate him. How about that? I never seen anything like it. Standing ovation from everybody in the ballpark. Fans in California haven't been the only ones to enjoy Halo heroics. At the 1983 All-Star Game in Chicago, Fred Lynn helped the American League break an 11-year losing streak. And he drives into the right. That goes Murphy way back. And there it is, the first grand slam in All-Star history. When I was rounding first, you know, I kind of did a little fist pump, and I never did that kind of stuff. I don't want to show anybody up. But I was just happy that I knew we were going to win. That put us up 7-1. We ended up winning that game 13-3. 20 years later, the Midsummer Classic returned to Chicago. And again, it was an angel who took center stage. And Garrett Anderson of the Anaheim Angels is the 2003 Home Run Derby champion. This time, however, it was a two-day power display. Now Anderson, the home run champ a night ago, hits a drive deep right center, and it's gone! Garrett Anderson is named the MVP of the 74th Major League Baseball All-Star Game. From peak performances to major milestones, Angel fans have had plenty to cheer about during the past 50 years. But no matter what triumphs have already been celebrated, the next half century of Angels baseball will provide plenty more. In 1993, the Angels asked former Halo coach Whitey Herzog, a baseball lifer with more than four decades of experience, to help evaluate talent. You went down to the minor league camps, and you looked at these young kids coming up, like Garrett Anderson and Tim Salmon, Troy Percival. He comes back and he tells Jackie Autry, whatever you do, 
do not mess with these kids. Do not trade these kids. Keep these kids, because these kids are your future. And they turned the organization basically over to their young players, and, and you could see some growth and stability starting to creep into the organization. Those youngsters formed the nucleus of the 1995 Angels team that proved to be a surprise contender. Salmon has just walloped his 30th home run here in his fabulous rookie season. Do you think that maybe some people are starting to take note of us a little bit? I think so. I mean, every night, if he's starting to put up more runs on the board, I think people are starting to say, hey, this team can hit and this team can play some defense, as well as the pitching. When I was out there, it didn't matter if it was my mother in the box. I'm trying to get you out, and I don't care if I got to hit you to do it. I'm going to get you out one way or another. Strike three. Swing and a miss. A half dozen strikeouts. Mark Langston, a great performance. The competition within the pitching staff, having Chuck and Mark, we had a lot of pride in those staffs. I mean, we worked hard. Every one of those guys to a man worked hard. Strike him out! Here's a long one on a 3 0 pitch. No! A two run home run! It was a situation where everything just kind of came together and gelled. We didn't go out and build that team with free agents. We built that team through the minor league system, through our drafts and developing those players and getting them to the major leagues, then it was quite a thing to see. The Angels win the game! And the heart and soul of that team was all-star shortstop Gary DeSarcina. Up the middle, DeSarcina, quickly up the throw, and it burst, oh baby! By early August, the Angels had built an 11-game division lead, and DeSarcina severely injured his thumb. Gary DeSarcina, that left hand torn ligaments there, and he will be missing for the rest of the season for the Angels. When he went down, we just, we didn't recover. We lost so many games by one run. If we scored, we didn't pitch. If we pitched, we didn't score, and it's just nothing worked out right. And I remember the whole time just thinking, man, Gary DeSarcina is that good. Reeling, the Angels squandered their lead and finished the season in a first place tie with Seattle still hurts that we let it get to a one-game playoff. Strike three call. Randy Johnson was as dominant as a pitcher you could probably saw in the game of baseball at the time. You know, he was unhittable. The slider gets But Langston was sharp too, and through six innings, the Mariners held a slim one-to-nothing lead. That one game playoff with Randy Johnson pitching against Mark, Mark Langston is still one of the best games I've ever been a part of. In the seventh, the Mariners broke it open and the Angels' collapse was complete. Now the broken back, it's fair! Flowers has scored, Gino Martinez has scored, and they all have scored! And here comes Soho! Drive! <laughs> I remember laying on my back, looking up at that kingdom ceiling that I've seen so many times when I play in Seattle, stretching, just going, are you kidding me? I cannot believe that, that this just happened. 1997 brought many changes to the organization. New ownership partners, the Walt Disney Company. New uniforms, with wings. And a new name, the Anaheim Angels. Meanwhile, Jim Edmonds continued to develop into one of the best center fielders in the game. Deep right field, back as Ramirez looks up, that ball is gone. There's a fly ball center field, long run for Jim Edmonds. Oh, he made a catch! Unbelievable! Jerry, that may be the best catch I have ever seen. He is absolutely phenomenal in center field. And Chuck Finley passed Nolan Ryan to become the team's all-time leader in wins with career victory number 139. For the 1998 season, the Angels unveiled a newly renovated ballpark to the cheers of many fans in Anaheim. But they also had to bid farewell to the Cowboy as longtime owner Gene Autry passed away at age 91. 
That number signifies the 26th man, Gene Autry. I remember watching Gene Autry on Saturday. Oh, don't we all? Oh. Gene was a great owner. Loved life, loved the game of baseball. His family was the 25 guys on that team. He really loved his players, and that's the one thing that I learned as I got into the organization is we had the best owner. He loved his players, and he, he loved being around them. Gene Autry's death marked the end of an era for the Angels franchise. But it also marked a new beginning. He had to catch the ball barehanded the first day of spring training. In 2000, former Dodgers catcher Mike Sosha took over as manager. I knew about his leadership abilities because I'd seen that during the two hours. His aggressiveness obviously came out, but his ability to communicate, his intelligence, his passion for the game, that's what led me to decide Mike was the guy to have the job. I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Bill and uh, Mr. Tavares for giving me this opportunity. Oh, get up. Get up, Paul. When Stoneman brought in Socia, it was the first step to get some tradition around here. The first time in our history, we had somebody at the reins that we could build on. That way, Tony Lewis Troy. When he came in, he made us believe that we are as good as anybody and we're not going to settle for anything less. He struck him out. Behind their rookie skipper, the Halos enjoyed a 12 game improvement in the win column. His greatest asset and his impact was just his attitude toward winning. Hammering away to right field, Jay Buter going back. Number 47. Troy Gloss hits his 47. Angels right back in the ball game. You saw the likes of Tim Salmon and Garrett Anderson, Darren Erstad, Troy Gloss, Troy Percival come up through the 90s play well, play at a high level, and that gave us a great foundation moving forward. For the 2002 season, the Angels took on a brand new look. The halo made its return, and the uniforms were red hot. But the team's performance in April was just the opposite. The Angels facing some pressure to turn it around here early in the season. More than 10 games out of first place toward the end of April, the Angels needed a spark, and they got it from the bat of their 5'6 inch shortstop, David Eckstein. It is out of here! Grand Slam, David Eckstein! He's done it! You know, it was one of those things during a season that many people stepped up at that point in time. That's it was my contribution. Eckstein's hot bat ignited a fire as the Torrid Angels won 19 of their next 23 games. Just another halo victory. There were no egos. Everybody came in and understood what their role was. Great bunch of guys, bunch of gamers. There's Jared Erstad with a brilliant catch. With April's struggles behind them, the Angels adopted a never-say-die credo as they engineered 43 come-from-behind victories. And it's gone! Spazio comes right back for the Halos! Thanks in part to a new good luck charm. You put the rally monkey up on the scoreboard and this place went berserk. It was so funny that it really made you laugh and it kind of lightened the tension for us. <laughs> and once the Angels rallied, their bullpen shut the door as September call-up Francisco Rodriguez joined closer Troy Percival to form an unhittable late-inning tandem. By the end of September, the Angels had recorded a franchise record 99 wins, earning them the American League wildcard. And a trip to the postseason for the first time in 16 years. And the Angels have clinched the playoff spot. For me and for some of the guys that had experienced the 95 and 97 collapses and longtime Angel guys, I mean, it was a huge relief to finally get there. We finally got into the dance. We've been watching the playoffs every year, our whole career. Now we have a chance to go into the playoffs. But on deck was a battle-tested Yankee squad that was making its eighth straight playoff appearance. 
playing them in the first round wasn't like, oh no, we're playing the Yankees. It's like, you know, we're playing a team that we know we can beat. You get the feeling, though, this young, scrappy, aggressive bunch has a shot against New York. You see no fear in their eyes. In the Bronx, the Bombers took game one, but in their now customary fashion, the Halos bounce back to even the series. At home out west, the Angels won the next two games to seal the series and a berth in the ALCS. Percy delivers and it's popped up. Third base side, Eckstein, the shortstop, makes the catch. The Anaheim Angels for the first time march on to the American League Championship Series. When we beat the Yankees, it was like, okay, we just beat the best team. Now nobody's going to stop us. In Minnesota, the Angels quickly found themselves in a familiar spot. Strike three called in Minnesota has taken game one. But once again, the Angels stormed back and won the next three games. In game five, Adam Kennedy put on a rare power display. Three home runs for someone like me, definitely not trying to do it. The Angels lead it, six to five. But, uh, you know, it was, it was a fun day for, for everybody involved. Kennedy's three homers and a 10-run seventh would elevate the Angels to their first World Series. And the Anaheim Angels are the 2002 American League champions. And the Anaheim Angels for the first time. It's game one of the World Series 2002, the Anaheim Angels and the San Francisco Giants. Led by the slugging Barry Bonds, the Giants powered their way to an early series lead. The Giants take game one from the Angels, four to three. The Halos took an early lead in game two, but with the score tied in the eighth, the franchise's all-time leader in home runs stepped to the plate. Two out in the eighth for Tim Salmon. It's belted to left field. This one has a chance. Bonds at the wall. The Angels lead it. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I just now hit a home run in the World Series, and it's probably a game winner. I felt like, okay, I got to slow this thing down and just take this in because the crowd was going bananas. The Angels managed to hold on and close out the game to tie up the series. The Angels win the ball game, 11 to 10. The Angels' first ever World Series win, just another Halo victory. The Halos kept their momentum going into game three and took a two to one lead in the fall classic. But after back-to-back -back losses in games four and five, they headed back to Anaheim, facing elimination. It's a do or die game for the Angels. They have to win it to force a game seven. The Giants got on the board first. That is crushed. Oh. And the Angels were running out of time. Four to nothing Giants trying to wrap up the World Series tonight. Once the score was five nothing Giants, the coronation seemed certain. But in the bottom of the seventh, with two on and one out, first baseman Scott Spezio stepped up to the plate, hoping to cut into the deficit. I know it was a huge at bat when I was coming up there. This is a big at bat for Scott Spezio. I was preparing myself uh, to drive in a run any way possible. I knew we needed a spark. 3 2 pitch. It's belted to right field. Back on it goes Sanders at the wall. He can't get it. The Angels kept chipping away, adding three more runs in the eighth to take the lead. Up 6-5 in the ninth, they handed the ball to their closer. Troy Percival comes on to try and nail this one down. The Angels are one out away from sending it to a game seven tomorrow when they look like they were dead and buried tonight. The 2-2 two -two pitch. Game 
seven incredibly. Six to five, the Angels have defeated the Giants with an incredible comeback in the late innings. It's do or die tonight. Rookie John Lackey was given the ball for the biggest game in Angels history. And in the bottom of the third, Garrett Anderson provided him with a three-run cushion. A line drive down the right field line! That's headed into the corner! Sanders is over to play it! Eckstein's in! Erstad's in! Here comes Salmon! He scores! Garrett Anderson clears the bases! And the Angels lead 4-1! to one. In the ninth, the Angels once again called on Troy Percival to finish the job and claim the championship. We move into the ninth inning. Game number seven. And Troy Percival, six for six. And save chances in the postseason. I mean, it was so loud in there. Our fans were electric. The Angels are one out away. Here's the pitch to Lofton. Fly ball, center field. Erstad says he's got it. Erstad makes the catch. The Anaheim Angels are the champions of baseball. Next thing I knew, I had Benji Molina on my back. And it was, I didn't even get to see a whole lot of the celebration because I was down on the bottom of the pile tr trying to get him off of me. The 42-year wait comes to an end as the Anaheim it may have taken more than four decades, but it was well worth the wait. The Angels were the world champions. That team honored and recognized all the players from the past. And uh, I think it was just a very, very special time that uh, just can't be duplicated. You have to almost catch yourself and go, you know, wow, this is it. We did it. And the exhilaration I felt for the players was uh, was really what I'm going to take away from that moment. World champion. Is that amazing? Yeah, that's what I'm going to say. Unbelievable. It was a great victory for the Angels, a great victory for Mike and the guys. Uh, but I think my first emotion was, you know, uh, we always wanted to win one for the Cowboy. Gene Autry, I know you're up there. Your beloved Angels have done it. The Big A is finally the home of a champion. He might have been hiding under that hat, or he might have been on top of that hat. But the minute you saw the hat, you knew that Gene Autry was there. I felt Gene's presence all the time. You could feel it, and um, it just got chills. Get your shirt! I got your hat! <laughs> After the championship of 2002 and that offseason certainly seemed very, very short. We went from 2.3 million fans watching us in 2002 to over 3 million for the first time in 2003. So we've been waiting for a lifetime right there. Oh. Not too much looks very much better, I'll tell you what. Now, the proud owners of World Series rings, the Angels had finally escaped the long shadow of the Dodgers by winning a world championship. I grew up in this area, so I, I always knew that there was the Dodgers and then there was the Angels. And I was so glad to be a part of the Angels becoming a major franchise that was now no longer looked at as the other team. We had a big change in 2003 at the same time, and that was a change in ownership. Barty Marino purchased us and said from day one at the press conference that the Angels are a big market club and they're going to conduct themselves accordingly. After a down year in 2003, the new owner proved true to his word and invested heavily in the free agent market, adding pitchers Bartolo Colon and Calvin Escobar, as well as four-time all-star outfielder Vladimir Guerrero. 
I got the play go. He said he's very happy to be here. <laughs> it created a lot of buzz. When you add a player at that point in his career to a lineup that's already pretty good, it takes it to another level. He came in and it was immediate impact, and it was from day one. Here's the next pitch, and he swings and drills a ball in the gap in left center field. It's out of here! Vlad Guerrero! He is driven tonight and he's hit two homers we had sizzle back you know, the Lakers have their showtime we had our sizzle Vladdy became just the second player in franchise history to be named MVP oh my how far is this one going as he finished his first season in Anaheim with 39 homers and 126 runs batted in to help the Halos capture the division crown couldn't get enough of it Gabannon short of the warning track The next year, Bartolo Colon took his turn as the best in the league, winning 21 games and becoming the second Angels pitcher to capture the Cy Young Award. Here's the 3-2. He got him swung on and missed. Fastball struck him out. Bartolo's command of his pitches was second to none. He, he just he could put the fastball just about anywhere he wanted it. He threw hard, and he maintained it throughout the whole year. And Bartolo Colon becomes the first 20-game winner since the great Nolan Ryan in 1974. Behind Colon's arm and Guerrero's bat, the Angels won the American League West for the second straight year, setting up another division series clash with the perennial postseason powerhouse from New York. For the second time in four years, pinstripes were no match for Big Red. We got it! The ball game is over! The series is over! And the Angels win it over the Yankees! Although they fell short of a return to the World Series, in just three seasons under new ownership, the Angels had become one of the most consistent teams and strongest organizations in baseball. Artie is really big on, on winning. He wants to win as bad as anybody I've ever been around, and really that's our charge, to win. Our goal is to do everything better than the other 29 clubs, and Artie has been instrumental in instilling that type of mentality. He put this together right here. No, 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 no. He put this together right here. The scope and the vision that he has as far as embracing the fans and giving the fans the best experience at the ballpark. There's an unusual connection that Artie has had with the fans. Have fun at I, huh? And they have responded with their love of the Moreno family. With a devoted owner, stable leadership, and a robust farm system, these angels were built for continued success. Well, I think any franchise, if you're going to have success, you have to keep developing players. And at some point, those young players are going to come up and push some of the older players or force their own opportunity. That has to take place. Sean Figgins goes six for six. Just another halo victory. As one generation of stars gradually made way for the next, the franchise continued to contend year in and year out. It was now the Angels' way. As Kedja Morales steps up now, and he swings it, drills one out to deep right center field. Goal! The Cuban Missile with a two-run foul! In 2007, John Lackey led the Halo staff with 19 wins and topped the league in ERA. Struck him out! What a game for John Lackey! By October, the Angels had clinched the division for the third time in four years, but were swept by the Red Sox in three straight to end their season. And for the Angels, a very disappointing end to a good season. Eager for a return to glory, the team continued to add talent to its roster. Oh, Hunter my. jumps on this one, and the Angels go in front. Including one of the most exciting players in the game. And he comes up with it. Great play by Tory Hunter. That's what I'm talking about. Hey, he's he's
And their homegrown talent just kept getting better as closer Frankie Rodriguez set a new single season record with 62 saves in 2008. Sliders struck him out! For the first time in franchise history, the Angels had the most wins in the majors and locked down another AL West crown. In there, strike three called. 100 wins for the Angels in 2008. What a tribute to the fans. The Angels with a dream season so far, regular season. They'd like to see it carry on. But the playoffs ended in frustration again as Boston, for the fourth time, proved to be a postseason roadblock. He bounces one right side. Here comes Bay right there. Willits runs up. Throw the plate. Red Sox win it. The Red Sox were their nemesis, and, and for whatever reason, the Red Sox had their number. And the Red Sox were in their heads and, and had been. And you always wonder, are they ever going to get over this hump? A different kind of challenge faced the Angels in 2009 as they mourned the passing of beloved club executive Preston Gomez in January and then were shaken by the sudden loss of rookie pitcher Nick Aidenhart in April. It was like we, uh, we were all there and, uh, and it, it affected everybody. You know, still thinking about it is tough. I wondered. Uh, really throughout the, the season, would this hold us back? Would this get in our way? And, and we all had the same feelings. Seeking their third straight division title, the Halos played through the pain, and led by a combination of emerging youngsters and a solid core of veterans, the resilient Angels got the job done. The one-two pitch, a swing, a ground ball third, Figgins backhands, his throw, in time, Angels win! 2009 is an American League West three-peat for the Angels. Light up the halo. As fate would have it, their division series opponent was a familiar foe. But this time, the script would be rewritten. We got up two games, nothing, played two very good games at home. Went out there for game three, found ourselves behind against one of the best closers in the game, and Vlad came through. Base is loaded, two outs, the pitch to Vlad. He lines at the center field and drops in front of Ellsbury. Biggin scores. Here comes Abreu to score. And the Angels have rallied off of Jonathan Papelbon to take the lead in the ninth inning. Vlad Guerrero gets the clutch hit. I remember after he had a, a sense of, you know, just peace. It was a, a more a matter of, yeah, I did it. I came through and I got the big hit. We beat these guys. Madroya pops one into shallow left center. Ibar goes back and makes the catch. And the Angels have knocked out the Boston Red Sox, sweeping them in three games. It was one of those great, great moments for Angel fans, you know, especially for Vladimir Guerrero, who is one of the greatest players of the generation. For a franchise that did not win a playoff series in its first 40 years, the Angels have enjoyed remarkable success so far in the 21st century. In 2010, Anaheim was back in the spotlight for the 81st All-Star Game. It was the third time the Angels had hosted the Midsummer Classic, having also done so in 1967 and 1989. But the All-Star Game it's, itself was something that, that we look back with a great sense of pride. It was good for the city, it was good for the Angels, for the fan experience, for what people see with Angels baseball now. We're recognized outside of our community uh, for being a model franchise, and we're very, very proud of that. As the Angels celebrate their 50th anniversary in 2011, the team and its fans will honor the past while continuing to look towards the future. And the Angels win it in the bottom of the 12th inning. You can put a halo over this one. Complete game shutout for Jared Weaver. He is now 6-0 and oh to start the year. Moving forward, this last decade has been very, very rewarding and satisfying. And we look to enter the next 50 years with the same approach that this last decade has shown, and that is with stability, continuity, and a contending organization.
American League's new Los Angeles club, the Angels. We want to teach it all the way up the line. That's the Angel way, the way we want you to cover first base. Congratulations to Mike Sosha, career win number 1,000. Stramski looking up, but there is a home run for Bob Rogers. Here comes Bellion. Oh, he is out! A backhanded feed from Molina, and then K Rod blocked him off the plate. Chili cracks one to right center field. Uh -huh. Jimmy Davis wins the ball game. On the run is Erstead. He makes a great catch. Angel fans and Salmon has given them 15 years of the best he has. <laughs>